To understand the upcoming battles over the impeachment of Donald Trump, let's start with the hockey puck theory of politics. If your team slams the puck into the goal and the referee tries to remove it, if the ref tries to cancel out the point you just won, you will be furious. And for good reason. That goal raises your sense of power and status. It raises the sense of power and status of the group you belong to. And that sense of pecking order lift has a powerful impact, not just on your emotions, but on your physiology. So there is no way you are going to stay silent about the ref taking your puck out of the goal. Let's be realistic. The puck is nothing. It's not beautiful. It's not useful outside of the hockey arena. It's not made of golden gems, but it carries a value greater than golden gems. When it's in the net and your team has slammed it there, that puck is a symbol. It stands for the pecking order status and power of your entire group. And the puck is not alone. The flag stands for the status of a group. Fly it high and you make one kind of statement. Throw it on the ground, walk on it, and light it on fire, and you make a very different kind of statement. Subcultures are willing to get into mass fistfights over which way to treat that symbol, or even wars. Mob fistfights or wars over a mere swatch of cloth. Like flags and pucks, a president is a symbol. He stands for the win of your subculture over another, a win in an election. The higher his stature, the higher the statue of the group who slammed him into the White House. Once that president is in the White House, there is no way the group that got him there, the group he symbolizes, is going to let the ref take him out. And in the American Constitution, there is a ref. It's the Congress. The Congress and its ability to impeach. So it doesn't matter what sins against democracy in the Constitution Donald Trump may have committed. There's no way that the folks Trump stands for are going to let him be pried out of the White House. There is no way they are going to let the ref yank him out of the goal. There's no way they are going to impeach him. Donald Trump's backers are conveniently clumped together in a group with a name, the Republican Party. And Trump's opponents are massed together in the Democratic Party. The Constitution says that it's the job of the Congress to spot bribery, treason, and high crimes and misdemeanors. It's the job of the Congress to impeach a president if he is guilty of crimes against the Constitution. This year, the Congress happens to have a Democratic majority. So the Democratic referees have decided that the president has sinned against the Constitution and deserves to be pried out of the White House. But the Constitution says that it's the job of the Senate to hold a trial to decide if the charges presented by the Congress, the impeachment presented by the Congress, mean that the president should be yanked out of the Oval Office, the Lincoln Bedroom, and the Situation Room. This year, the Senate just happens to have a Republican majority, and there is no way the members of the Republican team are going to yank their own puck out of the goal. So President Donald Trump will not be tossed out of office. It's the hockey puck theory of politics. But why do symbols have so much power over us? Why are flags sacred? And how do some men or women come to stand for the very soul and the very stature of an entire group? How has Donald Trump come to stand for the social status of a group that includes roughly 134 million Americans? In the book The Great Revolt by Selena Zito and Brad Todd, a Republican CNN political analyst and a Republican strategist, Zito and Todd give more than just statistics. They sit you down with roughly a half a dozen or a dozen die-hard Trump fans and let you hear their words. Most of these are upper-middle-class Midwesterners in their 50s or 60s who feel that they have worked their way up the pecking order with hard work and honesty. Many of them are former Democrats. So why have they left the Democratic Party and embraced Donald Trump? They feel that Democrats have spent so much time focusing on the poor and minorities that the Democrats no longer represent them. The Democrats, in fact, seem to despise them. 
in the politically correct universe of the liberal elite, which I'm a part of, they feel that white middle-class people like themselves have been labeled the enemy. Donald Trump, they feel, is their champion, a businessman who represents their identity. Trump, they feel, is against the giveaways that they are convinced threaten to remove the work ethic from American society. Replacing the work ethic with entitlements negates everything they've achieved. It negates their stature, their pecking order position in American society. It takes away their puck. And both animals and people feel very strongly about their pecking order position. Try to lower animals or humans on the social totem pole, and you get a fight. Donald Trump has promised over and over again to stand up for the folks who show up at his rallies, his die-hard supporters, to go to bat for them. So how do those folks committed to hard work and honesty deal with Donald Trump's lies and grab them by the pussy approach to life? They think Trump's flaws only prove that he is like them, fallible. And the way the mainstream media jumps on those flaws brings them to Trump's defense. Why? Because they're convinced that the mainstream press represents an elite that despises them, the coastal elite of New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. Look at this from the point of view of the pecking order of groups. A uh, concept that's crucial to my first two books, The Lucifer Principle and Global Brain. A pecking order is something that was studied from 1904 to 1921 by Thorleif Sheldrup Ebb in Norway. Sheldrup Ebb grew up with the barnyard chickens of his parents' summer home in Oslo. And when he was just 10 years old, he realized that barnyard chickens keep the peace with a strict social order. So he started to take notes and to keep track of who pecked whom and how many times. Yes, when he was still 10 years old, just a kid. 17 years later, Sheldrup Ebb turned those notes and the work he did after them into a graduate thesis. Here's what he discovered. The top chicken gets to go to the food trough first. And that top chicken has another privilege. She gets to peck every other chicken in the flock. After the top chicken comes chicken number two. She gets to go to the food trough second. And like the top chicken, she has another privilege. She gets to peck every other chicken in the flock with one exception. The exception of chicken number one. Then comes chicken number three. She goes to the trough third, and she can peck every other chicken in the flock with the exception of two. She cannot peck chicken number one or chicken number two and so on, all the way down to the bottom chicken in the pecking order. Every single chicken in the flock can peck on her, and she can't peck on anybody at all. As a result, she is a mess, featherless and covered with sores. Nobody wants to be the bottom chicken in the flock, and everybody wants to be chicken number one. More to the point, nobody wants to move down even a single notch in the pecking order. Everybody wants to move up. There's a new oppression Olympics. Get that phrase. An Olympics of oppression in the intellectual elite. You score points for every grievance you can rack up against imperialists and capitalists. You score points for every disadvantage you can complain about. In these oppression Olympics, white middle-class Americans and the wealthy folks they aspire to become are the source of every monstrosity in the world, every injustice. And the worst offenders are white middle-class males. According to Donald Trump's fans, Trump says that white middle-class folks who worked hard for what they've got are the people who will make America great again. The hard-working white middle-class are the people who will stop America's apology tours and its politics of, I'm sorry. Make America great again really means making the hard-working American middle-class great again, or that's the way Trump's fans perceive it. It means moving that white middle class back up on the pecking order, back up to the reigning position they had for roughly a century. And in the eyes of his supporters, Donald Trump stands for that white, hard-working middle class the way the hockey puck stands for the people of Boston, New York, Chicago, Pittsburgh, or Toronto. No wonder roughly 134 million people, Americans, don't want the Senate 
to yank Donald Trump out of the goal. He's a symbol. He's a puck. This is Howard Bloom speaking to you from the future. It's your job and my job to make. Or want to know why? Ask how. And now for that infamous, sneaky, sleazy, slimy, seditious, little off button. It's out to defeat me, but I think I've got it. <laughs>